Hello everyone, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Let me check my preview here and see if I'm actually working, because YouTube has decided not to let me. Refresh that. Copy that. Put you kind people up here for me to see. And I gotta fix the, uh, the one on the stream. Where is YouTube chat? There we go. Yeah, if anybody's seeing a, a, a street, something that says the stream's down, just refresh. There was a glitch or something when I took the, first, uh, the stream down and took the other one up. I don't think they can hear you if they're seeing that, though. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Uh, hello everyone, hello everyone, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. Thank you for joining me this morning. It is a beautiful Sunday morning here in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and uh, if I understand correctly, I've got viewers here from all over the world, so this is just an amazing experience for, for all of us once again. There we go, there's the beginning of the dog video, look at that. The dogs are going to my folks' house to run around in the pool, and we can all enjoy them. Uh, here on the stream while we're talking about the law. So what are we talking about this morning? We have a lot of uh, interesting things to talk about. Um, Brandon, give me some feedback if, when you can on the audio. I'm going to bring it down a little bit more because I know we've had some complaints. So I brought it down to 35%. What are we going uh, to talk, talk about this morning? We're going to talk about uh, the law and what has happened in the last week. We're going to talk about a police officer who sued Black Lives Matter. Uh, not the organization Black Lives Matter, but rather the uh, hashtag Black Lives Matter. So we're going to see what happens when you try to sue a, uh, a hashtag, basically. Um, I thought there was a great opportunity to take a look at a Supreme Court case that is being reviewed, I think, for Sergio Rari right now. Sergio Rari is when the Supreme Court says, yes, we will hear the case. And so uh, this, uh, this case, this Nosal case, is both a case that's going to the Supreme Court and it's a Computer Fraud and Abuse Act case, which is the kind of case that uh, if you password share or if you hack a computer, you're guilty of a criminal violation and you're also liable under a civil remedy under that law as well so that's a big deal and if this supreme court case has its if this if this uh party has its way uh then all password sharing would be illegal if the if the owner of the computer system does not consent to the password sharing so for example if you've shared your netflix password with a friend and uh, netflix did not explicitly consent to that well that could fall under this or things like that because i do believe netflix and hbo tell you you can have multiple streams and how would you have multiple streams unless you used your password multiple times uh, either way, some things that were not criminal before would become both criminal and civilly reachable. Uh, we'll also go over the Alex Mauer docket correction, which seems to have caused a whole lot of confusion. And there's actually not much to it, so that won't be terribly, terribly long. And we'll go over more YouTube ad demonetization. I think I have some of this figured out. And maybe maybe we can we can all sort of clarify what's going on with YouTube right now. It's not that they're doing. It's not the same as the adpocalypse. This seems to be as a result of the adpocalypse that they've implemented some measures, and the measures are really weird. And why? So I thought it would be a good time to go over that. So how is everybody this morning? I haven't seen chat too much. Wow, there are so many of you here. Hello from Green Lane, PA. Hello, what did I miss? <laughs> you haven't missed anything. Sorry. It just started. Uh, we've, we're just going over what we're going over, and I'm not going over it again. So uh, we'll go over it. We'll, Live. We'll, we'll go over it in real time. Oh, wait, you can't see that. <laughs> we'll go over it. Live. Um, maybe a so, so. tad bit lower on the music, even. A tad bit lower on the music. Okay. Yeah. 
there, just 5% lower. You have not missed the dogs. The dogs are both on a pre-recorded video that I shot on Friday, and the dogs are also on a special dog camera that I have set up just for the purpose. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, here is some dog butt for you. I think I can move the camera over a little bit, and you can see behind me and this beautiful pup that is Nico who is coming to say hi to me on stream. Mike Weber, thank you for the $10. First time catching a Sunday service, love what you do. Thanks for making copyright law enjoyable somehow. I appreciate it. Here, pupper, you wanna sit? You wanna sit? What a good boy. Here, why don't you go lay down on your bed back there? Hmm? Oh, you didn't put your hat on, Leonard. Oh, I didn't put my hat on. I'm so focused on everything else. Let's grab a hat. The lube has been hidden. <laughs> I'll be right back with the hat. Oh my god. I don't know where Freddy went, so we're doing Eeyore. How's that? Eeyore can hide my, uh, my earphones, too. <laughs> Eric, is the war on yet? <laughs> Thank you for the no region 20, uh, kroner. Alright, so there we go. Oh, you can't even see me, so... Here I am. In Eeyore. I couldn't, I don't know, I don't know where Freddy is. I, I wanted to wear Freddy. I, I don't know where Freddy is. Ah, uh, Stephen Wilson, here to start the Canadian tipping war. Yes, but who are you versus, Stephen? Are you versus this Canadian dollar versus the U.S. dollar? Versus the Mexican pesos? <laughs> Blackleaf, $10. Thank you. Can I add the en banc denial in the second uh, D.C. Second Amendment carry case to the discussion list? Does DC appeal or just accept it? Who wants to apply for a DHC, a DC uh, CHP? What is that? A handgun carry permit? Uh, sure, I'll apply with you. <laughs> Tactical. Thank you for the five dollars, Canadian. Oh, honey. Oh, honey. How are you? Let's go back to the dog cam. We've got, uh, you've got some dog butt on camera here. Okay, so if we don't get started, we're never going to get through all of this. So, uh, oh, uh, Blackleaf, if you could send me, or send Brandon, actually, send Brandon the research or, or links on that, and I'll see if I can get it in today. Uh, if not, we'll cover it this week or, or on the uh, next, uh, next stream. So, uh, let's see, what should we start with here? We've got some very interesting, uh, some, some cases here. How about we start with the computer fraud stuff? That will be a good uh, lighter, well, not all about lighter case. But this looks weird. What, um, why does this look so weird? And somebody yell at me if you think I've got too much stuff on the screen. I'm just trying to make it uh, interesting and fun for you. So this is a yellow book. It's a yellow or manila colored book. Um, it, it, it says in the Supreme Court of the United States, it says it was filed on September 19th, 2017. What is this weird looking book? I was actually really happy to find it in this format because you don't often see people save or, or scan the actual book. But this is a requirement. If you want to go to the Supreme Court, if you need to appeal to the Supreme Court, it is going to cost you an enormous amount of money for this book. The Supreme Court requires that all petitions basically appeals to the Supreme Court, but they are called uh, writ of certiorari, 
which is just a, a request for certification to the Supreme Court, but that's a very unique word. You won't hear that word really anywhere else. So if you hear certiorari, especially in connection with the law, it's probably talking about something that's trying to get certified before the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court does not take every case. The, the justices will read through these briefs, and because the justices are the justices, because they are final, and because they are infallible, they are very particular sometimes. And one of the things they're particular about is the format of this book. It has to be this book, this size. It is not a traditional size. It is like two-thirds of the size of a traditional sheet of paper. And uh, it, uh, it has to be formatted in exactly this way. And there's a, there's a lawyer out there who wrote an entire article about how he wanted to go to the Supreme Court without hiring the services that make these books for you because they wanted, in the order of five digits, they wanted ten to $15,000 to put this book together for him because it's a very particularly weirdly printed book. So what he did was he wrote a whole blog post about how he bought a cheap uh, well, not cheap, but a, a relatively cheap printer, still over $1,000 because it was a specialty printer, and basically made his books by hand. You have to make, I think, 23 of these books for every single filing, and they are all custom sizes. Not each one of them, but the, the book itself is a custom size, and everything has to be custom printed. It has to be absolutely perfect, or the Supreme Court just rejects the book. It doesn't reject your case. It just says this is an invalid filing, and you have to go do it over again. So you don't want that to happen. So this is a case involving the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, I, don't, I didn't actually look up the original conditions or original um, facts, so maybe we'll just go over this from the beginning. This is the reply brief in support of Sergio Rari. There's already been two previous briefs, one from this party, David Nosel, and then one from the U.S. attorney, who is the respondent. And no, no, we don't know what this is yet. So his introduction. Every day, hundreds of millions of Americans log into computers that belong to someone else under passwords or other personalized credentials. Under the rule adopted by the Ninth Circuit in this case, sharing those credentials is a federal crime, absent permissions from the computer owner. That is not the case in five other circuits, which have taken a number of different approaches to determining who may authorize access under the CFAA. The government does not seriously dispute that the circuits are divided over who may authorize access under the CFAA. Rather, it argues that no split is implicated in this case. The government is wrong. The government claims that the second and fourth circuits have not dealt with the same facts, but it fails to explain what difference those facts would make. The government contends that the first, fifth, and seventh circuits' interpretations of the CFAA would not change the outcome here, but in light of the jury instructions in this case, adopting any one of those interpretations would require vacating the convictions. The co if the conflict is real, outcome determinative, and urgently in need of resolution. The government's efforts to downplay the sweeping implications of the panel's majority's reasoning is no more persuasive. The government insists that the Ninth Circuit did not adopt a general rule that gives computer owners exclusive discretion over access in all cases. But the panel majority reas uh, reasoned that another person can authorize access only if the owner allows it. The government repeats the panel's majority claim that this case is not about password sharing. But the conduct punished as a violation of the CFAA in this case was, after all, the use of a password that has been freely shared to gain access to a computer. The amici, the friends of the, of the court, or amici, depending upon your, your, your Latin pronunciation, have warned that the Ninth Circus decision fuels long-standing uncertainty over the scope of the CFAA and threatens to criminalize a broad range of innocuous password sharing and socially, socially valuable research. CEFF amicus brief. That cannot be what Congress intended when it passed the CFAA to combat computer hacking. 
This case is the ideal vehicle for this court to finally address the question that has divided the courts and restored, uh, and restored the CFAA to its intended purpose. The court should grant review. Now, let me take a look here for a second at what in the world the EFF may have filed uh, in this case, because that may actually be a little bit more clear. All right, so here we go. This will be a lot easier and a lot shorter to go over. Let me copy this into Firefox since Chrome doesn't work on OBS anymore. <laughs> sure, Kate. I hear you. Okay, so here's what we got. <laughs> no, we don't. We'll, um... There we go. Thank you very much. Okay, so... EFF has filed three separate amicus briefs, briefs in this criminal case, explaining why the government's repeatedly expansive interpretation of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act threatens people engaging in innocent behavior with criminal liability. David Nosel, an ex-employee of the Corn Ferry executive recruiting firm, was charged with violating the CFAA on the theory that he induced current company employees to use their legitimate credentials to access the company's proprietary database and provide him with information in violation of the company's computer use policy. The government claimed the violation of this policy was a federal crime, but a lower court disagreed, throwing out some of the CFAA charges. When the government appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, we filed an amicus brief explaining how imposing criminal liability for merely violating a company policy would dramatically expand the CFAA and turn millions of law-abiding citizens into criminals. In an important 2012 decision, the Ninth Circuit agreed with us, ruling that accessing a workplace computer in violation of a corporate policy is not a CFAA violation. The Ninth Circuit returned the case to the lower court to handle the remaining CFAA charges. These were based on the government's theory that Nosel violated the CFAA when the other ex-employees acting on Nosel's behalf allegedly used legitimate access credentials of a current company employee with that employee's knowledge and permission to access Corn Ferry's proprietary database. The district court refused to dismiss these charges, and Nosel was convicted at jury trial and sentenced to one year and one day in prison. With his case on appeal before the Ninth Circuit again, the EFF filed another amicus brief in his support arguing that interpreting the CFA to criminalize using an authorized user's login credentials with their knowledge and permission ignores Congress's intent to make the CFAA an anti-hacking statute. More importantly, this interpretation of the CFAA makes criminals out of the millions of people who use login credentials of family members or friends with their knowledge or permission. You were saying something? I was not, but um, oh. Oh. We, you needed to meet the, the, uh, the audio on the dog video. I need to mute the video on, meet, meet the audio on the dog video? Yeah, yeah, it's really loud, apparently. Oh. I don't even know if that's up right now. Hang on. Dog, dog video. Muted. All right, what's the general consensus on the music? Should I keep the music, too? A few people are saying they want it muted. Um, let's, uh, let's, let's watch chat for a moment and see what chat thinks about the music. I can, I can mute it until the end. Sure thing. Sorry, did I make a noise and interrupt you? I apologize. No, that's, you didn't interrupt. I, th I thought you had something to add. I was going to wait till you were done reading this case to mention that to you. Everybody likes the music. Some people can't hear the music. Okay, good. All right, so back to Firefox here. 
No Soul is a United States Court of Appeals case dealing with the scope of criminal prosecutions of former employees. The Ninth Circuit's No Soul 1 established that employees have not exceeded authorization for the purposes of the CFAA if they access a computer in a manner that violates the company's use policies. But it appears that he was still convicted, and so he's appealing a second time. In the second decision, the Ninth Circuit attempted to clarify the meaning of without authorization in the context of the CFAA. Okay, we will follow this a little bit, uh, a little bit more um, as we go. There seems to be some uh, uh, some things happening with Sergio Rari, and, and when 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 Sergio Rari is granted or not, we'll we'll follow up on the case again. Because otherwise, we will be here all day talking about this one. This is going to get real complicated real quick. This one might even be a good a good video, a good a good source for an offline video because it's that complicated. <laughs> Wizard Angst asks if I can dress up one of my dogs as a judge with a funny wig and then plead the case to him. You know, I think I do have a judge's wig around here someplace that I got for one of the streams. So yes, I guess that is possible. Also, let me let me get to the super chats here. Um, Damon Redfield, uh, $2 Australian, can't stay up past 12 a.m., save the animals. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike Weber, gotcha, thank you very much. Eric, gotcha, Steven, gotcha, Blackleaf, gotcha, Tact uh, Tactical, gotcha, thank you very much. Uh, Grimundus Rex, $2, are you by chance in the market for a paralegal? Uh, no, not really, but um, I do need someone to do research for for stories and things, Um Brandon has offered to do that, and uh, I'm, it's going to definitely take more than one Brandon, so uh, you're definitely welcome to contact me and, and tell me what your terms would be for helping write some of the stories that need to be written for uh, offline uh, editing and recording and things. And for the live streams, I guess. Uh, Dana Strom, thank you for the $5 Canadian. Canada, for the first time catching a stream. Uh, Leonard, you are my favorite doggo stream with law education. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, Wizard Anx, thank you for the two donations of Australian $5. Leonard's favorite type of cloud is the Cirrocumulus. Ah, Cirrocumulus, nice. Can you dress up one of your do dogs as a judge? Yes, we'll do that. We'll try to do that. Clone myself quickly. Um, I can do it slowly, and I can only clone half of myself, and I might need your help, Kate, if you are still of childbearing ability and age. Anyway. Um, so, let's talk, I guess, next about the uh, Alex Mauer docket correction. Does that sound like a good one to talk about? On... What was it? On Tuesday, we got an Alex Maurer response in the Imagos case, and on uh, Thursday, it actually hit the docket. But it hit the docket. Here, I guess I'll try to bring up the docket. Let me um, let me try, let me do this offline on uh, Firefox, and I'll try to bring up the docket and show you what happened. Oh, actually, I might not be able to do that because they corrected the docket. You won't see what the initial. Uh, filing was. So maybe I'll just bring up the, the thing I posted on Twitter. Okay, so I need to go to my profile. I, I post a lot of things on Twitter. It was back here someplace. Here we go. So, this happened. And a lot of people have a lot of questions about what in the world this is. So, I posted this exact image, but this is just the docket text. Um, this is all publicly available information. So, what happened was, Alex filed her response on, or she attempted to file her response on the 26th at about 4 p.m., and I had filed our entry request for 
judgment for default, not for judgment, but just for default, at about noon 30. So she filed her response then three and a half hours later, but it was unsigned, and then the clerk wrote back to her and said, you have to sign this. She signed it later. She sent it to the clerk on Wednesday the 28th, no, 27th, and then on Thursday the 28th, the clerk entered it into the docket. Now, this is just a docket. The docket is the court record, and then um, and then the, 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 the docket gets reviewed by the court at the, at the appropriate times. The docket is just a record. It does not mean that, that anything that hits the docket is, is good or bad. It, it's just the public record of the court case. So when this hit the docket originally, it said this first line of blue text, answer to amended complaint and counterclaim against all plaintiffs by Alex Maurer. It dated 926 by JP. JP is the court's clerk, is the judge's clerk. Um, so that's how JP entered the uh, this this doc this this filing by Alex. Now, why would JP do that? Because JP read the response and saw that it seemed to be some kind of response, and yet it seemed to also contain some kind of claim against the plaintiffs. And when we went over that document, uh, it was maybe arguable that there was some kind of counterclaim in there. So I wasn't sure how the court was going to recognize it until uh, 928 here when it got entered on the docket. But then later on, on I think it was Friday, or early on Friday at some point, um, at 11.52 a.m., I think, on... Uh, oh, maybe it might have been, maybe it might have been on, on Friday still, I don't know. But uh, the docket text got amended so it now just says answer to amended complaint and it's removed any reference to counterclaim. So what does that mean? Well, I had to look up why it would be modified. So I looked up who L-I-S-A-D was. And at one point it, it occurred to me that that was Lisa, Lisa D. And I just had to go look for Lisa's name in the, in, in the, right, in the right place. And I found Lisa's name as a quality processor excuse me, a, a case processing quality control clerk so this this would be someone who checks the it basically double checks the docket entries to make sure that things are being done properly interpreted by the clerks properly because the clerks are often not lawyers and often not as legally trained and so the case processing quality control clerk is probably a more experienced clerk or maybe a special uh, a, a position just to do quality control of legal proceedings. So this person, Lisa D, read Alex's pleading and said, wait a second, we're not going to recognize this as a counterclaim. It doesn't say counterclaim. It doesn't seem to make any claims. It just seems to look like it, tri like it tried to be a claim. So if Alex wants it to be a claim, she's going to have to fix her entry or something like that. And instead of saying all that, all Lisa D had to do was just remove the reference to the counterclaim, and all is done. So, uh, so that's really all that that is. It does not mean that the court reviewed it or that the court approved of it. Um, it does not mean that that I did or did not do anything. I did. I have. I haven't done anything at all since we requested the entry of default. Um, and I will probably not be doing anything until early this week. I haven't quite decided what I'm going to file. Uh, I'm in the middle of my research right now. I'm doing research on motions for contempt and motions to strike or pleading and what all the legal standards are for this. And, uh, some of you have been wondering if I'm going to be trying to hold her in contempt. Uh, it looks like I'm going to be trying to hold her in criminal contempt. So we'll see how that goes. It's not the it's not like some big criminal charge. She's not getting thrown in jail or anything like that. I might be asking the court to hold her in criminal contempt and strike her pleading from the docket as a remedy for her disregard for the court and the court's deadlines that 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 she herself 
requested. So I'm going to ask the court to force her to show or not show good cause for the delay, and if she cannot show good cause for the delay, I'm going to ask the court to remove her pleading from the matter and let our default go through as the appropriate remedy for disregarding the court's authority. So, yay, right? Like, that's, that's, that's all good stuff. Um, what do we think about that? Uh, Jinzo, two dollars. Sheets or Wawa? Jinzo, Wawa. It's the it's in the name. I mean, come on. It, how can you not smile when you say Wawa? Just, just try it. Just try saying Wawa and not smiling. From the way you've spoken about Wawa in the past, you seem to hold it in a like godlike <laughs> reverent. Capacity in your mind. It's very strange. <laughs> you have to understand it. It's 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 nicely lit. It's clean. They usually have enough parking spaces and a large enough parking lot that everybody can fit. Um, it it it's, it doesn't smell bad. Uh, it just it seems to be where all the nice well not all the nice people go, but you know what I mean. It seems to be the nicest of the convenience store gas stations. I did miss two super chats. I am. I, I need to go back and uh, and catch those. Somewhere. Where did Chrome? Did I close Chrome? No, I didn't. There we go. Super chats. Ooh. So, um, Declan, thank you very much for the five British pounds. If I'm involved in an ongoing dispute and you're hired to represent the opposing party, does that mean you're still my favorite copy? I can still be your favorite copyright attorney. I just can't represent you if we are in a, uh, a conflict of interest, a concurrent conflict of interest. Uh, Janos Patsor, uh, 10 euros. Let me know if I got that correct. Uh, off topic, maybe for the end, how did you fix the 30-minute time limit on my 7D Mark II? I have one, but it won't stay on past 30 minutes, even when doing live view plus HDMI. Yes, I don't know how I've tricked it. The, I usually have to turn mine off and back on a few times until I get the little computer icon to stick on the, uh, on the back of the thing. Um, the little display will show a computer icon. The latest one actually didn't have that, but it still stayed on for the whole stream somehow. It might be related to temperature or not, so I'm not I'm not really sure. Also, why we're testing using my Sony... I forget. This is a Sony 4K action cam, the one that's popular right now. Um, this is a really awesome camera. I'm using it in 1080p, 50 megabit mode right now, and out... Um, uh, um, outputting its HDMI signal through my capture card the same way I would do. Uh, it has a little bit more of a delay. I had to put a 666 millisecond audio delay on here to sync everything up, but it seems to be working. So, uh, sorry for the uh, interruption, but I would like you all to know, you know, how to solve your technical problems. So let's um, let's go on to our big story today, or I don't know if I'd call this the big story, but this is this is a very interesting story, I think. This is in the United States District Court for the Middle District of Louisiana, which you know I'm not from Louisiana if I'm saying it Louisiana. Officer John Doe versus DeRay McKesson et al. Yanosh. Yanosh Pastor. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So this is Officer John Doe versus DeRay McKesson et al. Et al. means there are more parties, and you will find out very shortly who the other parties are. Before the court, our defendant DeRay McKesson's motion to dismiss, motion, uh, another motion to dismiss, and uh, the plaintiffs, the opposing parties, uh, motion for an amended complaint for damages. Plaintiff filed a memorandum in opposition to defendant's motion to dismiss under Rule 12. Defendant filed a reply in support, and plaintiff filed a reply in opposition. Plaintiff also filed a memo in opposition to defendant's Rule 9 motion, and the court held oral argument on both. And this is where it starts to get interesting. Quote, 
The practice of persons sharing common views, banding together to achieve a common end, is deeply embedded in the American political process. Because of its nature as a fundamental guarantee under the First Amendment to the United States Constitution, the right to associate does not lose all constitutional protection merely because some members of a group may have participated in conduct such as violence that itself was not protected. Thus, when a tort is committed in the context of activity that is otherwise protected by the First Amendment, courts must use precision in determining who may be held liable for the tortious conduct so that the guarantees of the First Amendment are not undermined. Plaintiff's alleged injuries in this case, which he claims to have suffered in the line of duty as a police officer while responding to a demonstration, are not to be minimized. Plaintiff has failed, however, to state a plausible claim for relief against an individual or entity that both has the capacity to be sued and falls within the precision tailor or the precisely tailored category of persons that may be held liable for his injuries, which he allegedly suffered during activity that was otherwise constitutionally protected. For the reasons explained herein, Defendant DeRay McKesson's motion to dismiss is granted. Plaintiff's motion to file an amended complaint are dismissed with prejudice, and this matter, this matter is dismissed with prejudice. Background. In his complaint, Plaintiff, a Baton Rouge Police Department officer, alleges that he responded to a demonstration that took place on July 9, 2016 at the intersection of Airline Highway and Goodward Boulevard. Plaintiff avers that Defendant DeRay McKesson led the protest, acting on behalf of defendant Black Lives Matter. Plaintiff asserts that Black Lives Matter is a na national, unincorporated association, of which McKesson is a leader and co-founder. Although plaintiff alleges that McKesson and Black Lives Matter were in Baton Rouge for the purpose of, of demonstrating, protesting, and rioting to incite others to violence against police and other law enforcement officers, plaintiff concedes that the demonstration was peaceful when it commenced. Plaintiff avers that the protest turned into a riot, however, when activists began pumping up the crowd. Thereafter, demonstrators allegedly began to loot a Circle K, taking water bottles from the business, and hurling them at the police officers who were positioned at the demonstration. Once the demonstrators had exhausted their supply of water bottles, plaintiff asserts that an unidentified demonstrator picked up a piece of concrete or a similar rock-like substance and hurled it into the police. Plaintiff allegedly was struck by this object, causing several serious injuries. Plaintiff alleges that McKesson was in charge of the protests and was seen and heard giving orders throughout the day and night of the protests. McKesson, according to Plaintiff, was present during the protest and did nothing to calm the crowd. Instead, McKesson allegedly incited the violence on behalf of Black Lives Matter. Plaintiff brought suit, naming McKesson and Black Lives Matter as defendants. In his complaint, Plaintiff states claims in negligence and responding at superior asserting that McKesson and Black Lives Matter knew or should have known that the physical contact, riot, and demonstration that they staged would become violent and that the violence would result. Uh, respondeat superior is a legal doctrine that says that you're, you can be responsible for the conduct of the people you are leading, as in a business for your employees or... Uh, uh, Basically, anyone you hire, a contractor, could be, could, would also be an agent under your control, and you would be responsible for their acts that were within your control or within your direction. The unidentified demonstrator who threw the object that allegedly struck plaintiff, he avers, was a member of Black Lives Matter and was under the control and custody of McKesson and Black Lives Matter. Therefore, according to plaintiff, McKesson and Black Lives Matter are liable in solido for the injuries caused to plaintiff by the unidentified demonstrator. Uh, in solido would be a Latin phrase. I don't know exactly what it means, but I'm going to interpret it to mean that together, that it means that the two of them are to be liable as one for the injuries caused to plaintiff by the unidentified demonstrator. 
McKesson thereafter filed defendant's uh, Rule 12 motion asserting that plaintiff failed to state a claim upon which relief can be granted, as well as defendant's Rule 9 motion asserting that Black Lives Matter is not an entity that has the capacity to be sued. Plaintiff responded by filing his motion to amend, seeking leave of court to amend his complaint to add hashtag Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter Network, Inc. as defendants to supplant to supplement his complaint with additional uh, factual allegations. Discussion. The court finds that plaintiff's complaint suffers from numerous deficiencies, namely that complaint fi- uh, the complaint fails to state a plausible claim for relief against McKesson, and it names as a defendant a social movement that lacks the capacity to be sued. In an attempt to ameliorate these deficiencies, plaintiff has sought leave of court to amend his complaint to name two additional defendants, hashtag Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter Network, Inc., and to plead additional factual allegations. Plaintiff's proposed amendment, however, would be futile. Plaintiff fails to remedy the deficiencies contained in his complaint with respect to his claims against McKesson and Black Lives Matter and the hashtag Black Lives Matter, which lacks the capacity to be sued, and plaintiff fails to state a plausible claim for relief against Black Lives Matter Network, Inc. Plaintiff's claims, therefore, must be dismissed, and plaintiff must be denied the opportunity to amend his complaint. Defendant's Rule 12 Motion Setting aside his conclusory allegations, plaintiff has pled facts that merely demonstrate that McKesson exercised his constitutional right to association and that he solely engaged in protected speech at the demonstration that took place in Baton Rouge on July 9, 2016. Because plaintiff has failed to plead a sufficient non-conclusory factual allegation that would tend to demonstrate that McKesson exceeded the bounds of protected speech, McKesson cannot be held liable for the conduct of others with whom he associated, and plaintiff thus failed to state a plausible claim for relief against McKesson. Legal Standard A motion to dismiss, filed pursuant to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12b-6, tests the sufficiency of a complaint against the legal standard set forth in Rule 8, which requires a short, plain statement of the claim showing that the pleader is entitled to relief. To survive a motion to dismiss, a complaint must contain sufficient factual matter accepted as true to state a claim for relief that is plausible on its face. Determining whether a complaint states a plausible claim for relief is a context-specific task that requires the reviewing court to draw on its judicial experience and common sense. Facial plausibility exists when the plaintiff pleads factual content that allows the court to draw the reasonable inference that the defendant is liable for the misconduct alleged. Thus, a complaint need not set out detailed factual allegations, but a complaint must contain something more than labels and conclusions or a formulaic recitation of the elements of a cause of action. When conducting its inquiry, the court must accept as Uh, must accept all well-pleaded facts as true and view those facts in the light most favorable to the plaintiff. The tenet that the court must accept as true all of the allegations contained in a complaint is inapplicable to legal conclusions, and therefore threadbare recitals of the elements of a cause of action supported by mere conclusory statements do not suffice to survive a 12b6 motion to dismiss. Analysis. The First Amendment does not protect violence. Certainly violence has no sanctuary in the First Amendment, and the use of weapons may not constitutionally masquerade under the guise of advocacy. The presence of activity protected by the First Amendment, however, imposes restraints on the grounds that may give rise to damages liability and on the persons who may be held accountable for those damage. Thus, while a person may be held liable in tort for the consequences of his violent conduct, a person cannot be held liable in tort for the consequences of nonviolent protected activity. Only those losses proximately caused by unlawful activity may be recovered. Now, this says a lot in this paragraph, so let me quickly summarize some of this. It says here that a person may be held or not held liable in tort. What is tort? T-O-R-T. Is that like something you go buy at the local pastry store? No. No. This is a special legal 
doctrine. It's a Latin word, and it means wrong, W-R-O-N-G. It means wrong. It's a legally recognized wrong or harm that you can do to a person. So if I hit you with my car, if I hit you with my baseball bat, if I, if I lock you up in a room and hold you imprisoned falsely, those are all torts against you, legal, legally recognized wrongs against you. <clears throat> in the body of tort law, there is a famous case, the Mrs. Paul's graph case, where a, a, someone was carrying fireworks onto a train, and the person carrying the fireworks was handing the box of fireworks to the train uh, conductor or whatever, the, the staff on the train to help them get onto the train. And the box was dropped and the fireworks went off and across the platform in the commotion, a person got injured. There's more detail to it than that, but... but the person was not injured by the actual train or the conductor, but rather by the commotion caused by the fireworks, if I recall correctly. And the person tried to sue the railroad. And the, the, the judge said, I'm sorry, but we have something called proximate cause. And proximate cause would say that you can only sue the people more or less directly or proximately uh, the cause of the injury or unlawful conduct. So the, the train conductor or staff in trying to help the passenger with the fireworks onto the, 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 uh, the, the train car, not knowing that there were fireworks in the box, uh, they didn't do anything wrong. So they really shouldn't be held liable for the commotion that was caused by the dropping of the box. The, certainly the person who's carrying explosives should be held liable. And we can do something called strict liability with explosives, but that's a whole other topic. But the point is, is that if, if you see a car accident in, on the highway in front of you, and you are not harmed by the car accident directly, but you're delayed and maybe you didn't get to go to your job interview because the highway got blocked by the car accident and you didn't get to your job interview in time. You may not have a case against the person who had the car collision because of the doctrine of proximate cause. That's the short version of that. Back to our case. The First Amendment similarly restricts, restricts the ability of a tort plaintiff to recover damages from an individual solely because of his association with another. Civil liability may not be imposed merely because an individual belonged to a group and some members of which committed acts of violence. For liability to be imposed by reason of association alone, it is necessary to establish that the group itself possessed unlawful goals and that the individual held a specific intent to further those illegal aims. This also contains some legalese. Specific intent is a, an intent above just an intent to commit a crime. It, it, I forget the exact legal definition. Now would actually be a really good time for me to look that up because it's been almost six years, seven years since my criminal law class, and I really don't. Uh, so we'll look up specific intent so we can all all understand. The term specific intent is commonly used in criminal and tort law to designate a special state of mind that is required along with a physical act to constitute certain crimes or torts. So you don't, you're not, you don't just have to have the regular level of intent or criminal mind or, or, or knowledge, but a specific intent as well. So that's saying that if you are associated with a group, let's say you're associated with a group that, 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 like, that has some violent members and some nonviolent members, and you, this is saying that you would have to be specifically associated with the violence. Uh, you would have to know that the group possessed unlawful goals and held an intent to further those goals. So there's obviously a little more to that. We're not going to go into that level of depth now. To impose tort liability on an individual for the torts of others with whom he associated, a plaintiff must prove that 1. the individual authorized, directed, or ratified specific tortious activity, 
Two, his public speech was likely to incite lawless action, and the tort followed within a reasonable period. Or three, his public speech was of such character that it could serve as evidence that he gave either specific instructions to carry out, that he gave other specific instructions to carry out violent acts or threats. In his complaint, plaintiff alleges that McKesson led the protest and violence that accompanied the protest. As support for this contention, plaintiff pleaded that McKesson was in charge of the protests and he was seen and heard giving orders throughout the day and night of the protests. Further, plaintiff avers that McKesson did nothing to calm the crowd during the demonstration. Rather, McKesson incited the violence. All of these allegations are conclusory in nature, however, and they do not give rise to a plausible claim for relief against McKesson. In order to state a claim for relief against McKesson to hold him liable for the tortious act of another with whom he was associated during the demonstration, plaintiff would have to allege facts that tend to demonstrate that McKesson authorized, directed, or ratified specific tortious activity. Plaintiff, however, merely states in a conclusory fashion that McKesson incited the violence and gave orders, but plaintiff does not state in his complaint how McKesson incited violence or what orders he allegedly was giving. Therefore, the complaint contains a threadbare recital of the elements of a cause of action against McKesson, which plaintiff only has supported with mere conclusory statements. And therefore, plaintiff's complaint does not contain sufficient factual matter accepted as true to state a claim to relief that is plausible on its face. Further, Plaintiff has not pleaded sufficient factual allegations regarding McKesson's public speech to state a cause of action against McKesson based on that speech. The only public speech to which plaintiff cites in his complaint is a one-sentence statement that McKesson allegedly made to the New York Times, quote, the police want protesters to be too afraid to protest, uh, end quote. McKesson's statement does not advocate or make any reference to violence of any kind, and even if the statement did, mere advocacy of the use of force or violence does not remove speech from the protection of the First Amendment. The statement falls far short of being likely to incite lawless action, which plaintiff would have to prove to hold McKesson liable based on his public speech. Nor can plaintiff premise McKesson's liability on the theory that he allegedly did nothing to calm the crowd. As the United States Supreme Court in NAACP versus Claiborne Hardware said, civil liability may not be imposed merely because an individual belonged to a group, some members of which committed acts of violence. Plaintiff, therefore, has failed to plead in his complaint factual content that allows the court to draw the reasonable inference that McKesson is liable for the misconduct alleged, and thus plaintiff claims, plaintiff's claims against McKesson must be dismissed. So everyone, the next time you hear someone say that a a protester is liable because he didn't do enough to calm the situation, you can call bullshit on that, and you can cite the U.S. Supreme Court. Here's where it gets even more interesting. Defendant's Rule 9 motion. The court finds that Black Lives Matter, as plaintiff uses the term in his complaint, refers to a social movement. Although many entities have utilized the phrase Black Lives Matter in their titles or business designations, Black Lives Matter itself is not an entity of any sort. Therefore, all claims against Black Lives Matter must be dismissed because social movements lack the capacity to be sued. Legal standard. Although a motion to dismiss for lack of capacity is not contemplated by the express provisions of Rule 12, such a motion is treated by the courts as a motion to dismiss pursuant to 12b-6 when the issue can be resolved by analyzing the face of the complaint. Although a defense of lack of capacity is not expressly mentioned in 12b-6, the practice has grown up of examining it by a 12b-6 motion when the, direct, when the defect appears on the face of the complaint. If the lack of capacity appears on the face of the pleadings or is discernible therefrom, the issue can be raised by a motion for failure to state a claim of relief. 
the court may treat a motion for lack of a motion to dismiss for lack of capacity as a motion to dismiss pursuant to 12b6, even if the motion is incorrectly labeled. To survive a motion to dismiss, the complaint must contain sufficient factual matter accepted as true to state a claim to relief that is plausible on its face. Um, also, any of you law students, rem- you can read through this and you can note these cases. These are cases you will see again, Iqbal and Twombly, you will see in jurisdiction in your uh, either evidence or procedure case, probably your procedure ca- uh, course. Determining whether a complaint states a plausible claim or uh, for relief is a context-specific task that requires the reviewing court to draw on its judicial experience and common sense. When conducting its inquiry, the court must accept as well-pleaded facts as true all well-pleaded tracts. All well. P- <laughs> the court must accept all well-pleaded facts as true and view those facts in the light most favorable to the plaintiff. The tenant that a court must accept as true all of the allegations contained in a complaint, however, is inapplicable to legal conclusions. When analyzing a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim, courts must also consider matters of which they may take judicial notice. Uh, That last sentence, judicial notice, is how the courts are allowed to consider things that are not in the record, that may be public knowledge, things like that. So uh, you can put a court on judicial notice as well by filing things that might not be allowable within the purview of the rules of evidence, but may still be helpful to the judge and let the judge use their discretion to decide whether they take them as judicial notice or enter them as evidence in the case. If a party is not an individual or a corporation, the capacity of that party to to be sued is determined by the law of the state where the court is located. Under Louisiana law, an entity must qualify as a judicial person to possess the capacity to be sued. A a, a juridical person, wow, a juridical, let's let's try it that way. Wow, that is not a word I have seen before. Before? I'm doing great today. (laughs) I am doing great today. I swear, this is this is regular old root beer. This is my favorite root beer. This is not alcohol, I swear. A juridical person is an entity to which the law attributes personality, such as a corporation or a partnership. For an unincorporated association to possess juridical personality, the object of the contract of association must necessarily be the creation of an entity whose personality is distinct from that of its members. One more time, for an unincorporated association to possess juridical personality, the entity and personality must be distinct from that of its members. Unless such an intent exists that the parties do not create such a fictitious person, but instead simply incur obligations among themselves, consequently, an unincorporated association, as a juridical person distinct from its members, does not come into existence or commerce, commence, merely by virtue of the fortuitous creation of a community of interest or the fact that a number of individuals have simply acted together. (laughs) Rather, there must also be an agreement why two or more persons combine certain attributes to create a separate entity for legitimate purposes. So that had a lot of very large words in it, and I mean, I had trouble um, parsing them all in real time. Um, But what it basically says is that when you don't have a formally formed corporation or a literal person standing in front of you, you have to analyze and figure out whether a group is an entity that's responsible for itself collectively, or whether it is just a loose organization of persons, of individuals who are individually responsible for their participation, but aren't forming a legally recognized group, here called a juridical person. McKesson, 
in his Rule 9 motion, argues that the court should dismiss Black Lives Matter as a defendant in this case because it lacks the capacity to be sued. According to defendant, Black Lives Matter is a movement and not a juridical entity capable of being sued. The court finds that the capacity of Black Lives Matter to be sued can be discerned from the face of the pleadings, and therefore it will treat defendant's Rule 9 motion as a motion to dismiss for failure to state a claim under Rule 12b-6. Federal Rule of Evidence 201 permits a court to judicially notice a fact that is not subject to reasonable dispute because it is generally known within the trial court's territorial jurisdiction. Courts previously have taken judicial notice of the character, nature, or composition of various social movements. Holding that the citing U.S. v. Paris, holding that the court can easily take judicial notice of the aims and goals of a union movement. Attorney General of U.S. v. Irish National Aid Committee. Commission. Under the doctrine of judicial notice, the, U, the court can observe that the Republican movement consists of groups other than, in addition to, the IRA, but the court can also notice that the IRA is a Republican movement. Also, Bagot v. Bullitt, 1964, noting that the lower court took judicial notice of the fact that the Communist Party of the United States was a part of the world communist movement dominated by the, so by the Soviet Union. In his complaint, plaintiff names Black Lives Matter as a defendant describing Black Lives Matter as a national, unincorporated association with chapters in many states, which is amenable to service of process through a managing member. Plaintiff alleges that Black Lives Matter was created by Alicia Garza, Patrice Cullers, and Opal Tometi, and that the leaders of Black Lives Matter are Rashad Turner, uh, Jeanette, Jeanetta Elzey, and DeRay McKesson. The court judicially notices that Black Lives Matter, as the term is used in the complaint, is a social movement that was catalyzed on social media by the persons listed in the complaint in response to the perceived mistreatment of African American citizens by law enforcement officers. Citing Paris and holding that the court could easily take judicial notice of the aims and goals of the union movement. Oh, and okay, so she's reciting her things she just said. Because Black Lives Matter as that term is used in the complaint, is a social movement rather than an organization or entity of any sort, its advent on social media was merely a fortuitous creation of a community of interest. Black Lives Matter, Matter was not created through a contract of association and is not an entity whose personality is distinct from that of its members, and therefore it is not a juridical person that is capable of being sued. The court wishes to note that the phrase Black Lives Matter has been utilized by various entities to identify themselves with the Black Lives Matter movement. Plaintiff himself has identified one such entity and seeks leave of court to add that entity as a defendant, Black Lives Matter Network, Inc. These entities undoubtedly are juridical persons capable of being sued, and therefore the issue of such an entity's capacity would not impede plaintiff from filing suit against it. Black Lives Matter as a social movement, however, cannot be sued, in a similar way that a person cannot plausibly sue other social movements such as the Civil Rights Movement, the LGBT Rights Movement, or the Tea Party Movement. If he could state a plausible claim for relief, plaintiff could bring suit against entities associated with these movements, though, such as the National Association for the Advancement of Color People, the Human Rights Campaign, or Tea Party Patriots, because those entities are juridical persons within the meaning of Louisiana law. Nevertheless, plaintiff merely has identified Black Lives Matter as a defendant in his complaint, and that term connotes a social movement that is not a juridical person and that lacks the capacity to be sued. Therefore, Black Lives Matter shall be dismissed as a defendant in this case because it lacks the capacity to be sued. Finally, plaintiff's motion to amend. Filing, following the filing, say that six times fast, of defendant's Rule 12 motion and defendant's Rule 9 motion, as well as the oral arguments on these motions, plaintiff sought leave of court to amend his complaint. Plaintiff includes two additional defendants in his proposed amended complaint, hashtag Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter, Matter Network, Inc., and invites or pleads additional factual allegations. In his proposed amended complaint, however, plaintiff nonetheless fails to state a plausible claim for relief against any of the named defendants. 
Black Lives Matter, a social movement, and Black Lives Matter, a hashtag, both lack the capacity to be sued, and plaintiff has failed to state plausible claims for relief against them that are supported by anything more than conclusory allegations. Therefore, plaintiff's proposed amended complaint would be subject to dismissal in its entirety, and the court should deny plaintiff leave of court to amend his complaint. Legal standard. If a party is not entitled to amend a pleading as a matter of course, pursuant to Rule 15, a party may amend its pleading only with the opposing party's written consent or the court, the court's leave. The court should freely give leave when justice so requires. A district court may refuse leave to amend, however, if the filing of the amended complaint would be futile. In other words, the court may deny plaintiff's motion to amend if the complaint as amended would also be subject to dismissal. Analysis. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. Plaintiff, in his proposed amended complaint, seeks to add as defendant hashtag Black Lives Matter. Plaintiffs allege that this hashtag is a national unincorporated association that is domiciled in California. The court judicially notices that a combination of a pound or number sign and a word or phrase is referred to as a hashtag, and that hashtags are utilized on the social media website Twitter in order to classify or categorize a user's particular tweet, although the use of hashtags has spread to other social media websites throughout popular culture. And she quotes a couple cases. A hashtag is a word or phrase preceded by the symbol, etc. The court also judicially notices that Black Lives Matter is a popular hashtag that is frequently used on social media and websites. Plaintiff, therefore, is attempting to sue a hashtag for damages in tort. For reasons that should be obvious, a hashtag, which is an expression that categorizes or classifies a person's thought, is not a juridical person and therefore lacks the capacity to be sued. The court notes, footnote here, the court notes that if plaintiff were not bearing his own costs, which otherwise would be borne by the taxpayers, 28 U.S.C. 1915, uh, 1915 would permit the court to dismiss this claim as frivolous a lawsuit that alleges a hashtag, which is, in essence, an idea, is liable for tort in damages can properly be categorized as fantastic or delusional. So the, the, wow, the, the court, uh, that, that's a pretty, that's a pretty big smackdown there. I think the court has some issues with this. Amending the complaint to include hashtag Black Lives Matter as a defendant in this matter would be futile because the claims would be subject to dismissal as a hashtag is patently, on its face, incapable of being sued. Non-hashtag Black Lives Matter. Plaintiff also seeks to supplement the allegations regarding defendant Black Lives Matter. In his proposed amended complaint, plaintiff avers that Black Lives Matter is a chapter-based national unincorporated association that is organized under the laws of the state of California, though it allegedly is also a partnership that is a citizen of California and Delaware. For the reasons stated previously, in reference to the court's analysis of the Rule 9 motion, Black Lives Matter is a social movement that lacks the capacity to be sued. In fact, in his proposed amended complaint, plaintiff himself refers to Black Lives Matter as a movement on multiple occasions. And she cites several places. Amending the complaint to permit plaintiff to continue to pursue claims against Black Lives Matter would be futile because such claims would be subject to dismissal. For the reasons stated previously, Black Lives Matter is a social movement that is not a juridical person and lacks the capacity to be sued. On to McKesson. Plaintiff seeks to amend his complaint to include additional factual allegations in relation to McKesson's activities and public statements. Plaintiff seeks to supplement his complaint with allegations that McKesson made a statement on a television news program in which he allegedly justified the violence that occurred at a demonstration in Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore, Maryland? Baltimore? Engaged in a private conversation that allegedly shows an intent to use protests to have martial law declared nationwide through protests. Allegedly made a statement to a news website that people take to the streets as a last resort, which according to plaintiff was a ratification and justification for violence. 
participated in various interviews or speeches during which he allegedly described himself or was described as a leader of the Black Lives Matter movement or a participant in various demonstrations, and five, ratified all action taken during the Baton Rouge protest, and six, incited criminal conduct that caused injury. These supplemental factual allegations do not remedy plaintiff's failure to state a plausible claim for relief against McKesson. Plaintiff's allegation that McKesson ratified all action and incited criminal conduct are nothing but threadbare recitals of the elements of a cause of action, supported by merely conclusory statements, which do not suffice to survive a 12b6 motion to dismiss. Plaintiff's proposed amended complaint is devoid of any facts aside from these broad conclusory allegations that tend to suggest that McKesson made any statements or engaged in any conduct that authorized, directed, or ratified the unidentified demonstrator's act of throwing a rock at plaintiff. Further, the additional public statements that plaintiff has pleaded do not support a plausible claim for relief against McKesson. Turning to the footnote, Setting aside plaintiff's description of it in mere conclusory terms, the conversation in which plaintiff alleges that McKesson showed an interest to use protests to have martial law declared nationwide is a private conversation that cannot give rise to liability and tort for the actions of other demonstrators. See Claiborne Hardware, holding that liability may only be imposed on a person for the tortious acts of others with whom the person is associated if his public speech meets certain criteria. Rather than including the actual statement that McKesson allegedly made on a television news program, plaintiff merely pleads that McKesson justified the violence. And this, excuse me, pl merely pleads that, that McKesson justified the violence. This is a threadbare recital of the elements of a cause of action which is supported by mere conclusory statements. Mc McKesson's alleged statement that people take to the streets as a last resort similarly cannot give rise to a cause of action. It is not plausible this statement could be likely to incite lawless action or be of such a character that it could serve as evidence that he gave other specific instructions to the unidentified demonstrator to throw a rock at plaintiff. For moreover, to premise McKesson's liability on the sole basis of his public statements in which he identified himself as a leader of the Black Lives Matter movement or a participant in various demonstrations would impermissibly oppose liability on McKesson for merely exercising his right of association. Mere association with a group absent a specific intent to further an unlawful aim embraced by that group is insufficient, is an insufficient predicate for liability. Plaintiff therefore has failed to remedy the deficiencies that the court identified in his complaint and thus permitting plaintiff to amend his complaint to add various factual allegations against McKesson would be futile because none, because uh, such claims nonetheless would be subject to dismissal. Black Lives Matter Network, Inc. Plaintiff in his proposed amended complaint seeks to add Black Lives Matter Network, Inc. as a defendant. Plaintiff discovered the existence of the Network Inc. after making a donation to through a website that alleg allegedly identified with the Black Lives Matter movement. The receipt from the donation indicated that the network was the entity that received the donation. While the network certainly is an entity that has the capacity to be sued, plaintiff has failed to state a plausible claim for relief against that entity in his proposed amended complaint. For an entity such as Black Lives Matter Network Inc. to be held liable in tort for damages caused during a demonstration, a plaintiff must demonstrate the tortious act was committed by one of the entity's agents within the scope of their actual or apparent authority. Such an entity also may be found liable for such other conduct of which it had knowledge and specifically ratified. Plaintiff's only attempt at categorizing the unidentified tortfeasor as an agent of the network is located in paragraph 37, in which plaintiff alleges that the tortfeasor was a member of the network under control and custody. Not only does plaintiff specifically fail to mention Black Lives Matter network whatsoever, but plaintiff also fails to allege that any such agency relationship existed between the tortfeasor, the, the perpetrator, and defendants with anything more than a threadbare recital of the elements. Furthermore, plaintiff has failed to plead that Black Lives Matter Network in particular had knowledge and specifically ratified the unintended tortfeasor's act of throwing a rock at plaintiff. 
Plaintiff merely alleges in a conclusory fashion that the leadership ratified all action taken during the protest and that they pro promoted and ratified the tortious conduct that gave rise. These allegations are insufficient to state a plausible claim for relief against the network. Not only are these allegations conclusory statements, but they do not identify any connection between this particular entity and the entity uh, and the particular tortious activity. As the Supreme Court noted in Claiborne Hardware, allowing a plaintiff to proceed in this case based on these conclusory allegations would impermissibly burden the rights of political association that are protected by the First Amendment. Therefore, allowing plaintiff to amend his complaint to, allow, <clears throat> to add Black Lives Matter as a defendant would be futile because such claims would be subject to dismissal. Conclusion. Therefore, the court finds that plaintiff has failed to plead a plausible claim for relief against any of the defendants that he identified in his proposed amended complaint. Because the filing of the amended complaint would be futile. For the reasons stated above, the court finds that plaintiff has failed to state a plausible claim for relief against McKesson or Black Lives Matter, the only defendants in the initial complaint. Under normal circumstances, the court would dismiss this matter without prejudice to provide plaintiff with an opportunity to ameliorate the deficiencies that the court has identified in his complaint. Plaintiff has had op ample opportunity, however, following the briefing and argument on defendants Rule 12 and Rule 9 motions to demonstrate to the court that he can state a plausible claim for relief against individual or entity in response to the arguments raised by McKesson in his motions and by the court during oral argument on the motions, plaintiff nonetheless produced a proposed amended complaint that not only fails to state a plausible claim for relief against any of the named defendants, but also attempts to hold a hashtag liable for damages in tort. The court finds that the granting for leave uh, to attempt to file a second proposed amended complaint would be futile. The court also notes that plaintiff's attempt to bring suit against a social movement and a hashtag evinces either a gross lack of understanding of the concept of capacity or bad faith, which would be an independent ground to deny plaintiff leave to file a second proposed amended complaint. The court shall therefore dismiss this matter with prejudice. Accordingly, it is ordered that Defendant DeRay McKesson's motion to dismiss is granted, Defendant's motion to dismiss is uh, pursuant to Rule 9 is granted, the motion to file the amended complaint is denied, and the above-captioned matter is dismissed with prejudice. By Brian A. Jackson, Chief Judge, United States District Court, Middle District of Louisiana. Whew. So I know that was long. I'm sorry that was long, but that was really good, wasn't it? That had some really good stuff in it. So basically, stop wasting our time, find a real complaint, find the person who actually threw the rock at us and the, at you, and then we'll Yep. Back. You cannot, you cannot uh, sue a loosely organized group of people for the actions of an individual. You have to have very specific connections. <laughs> Excuse me. You have to have very specific connections between the acts and the entities in order for those entities to be held liable. So, uh, wow, what do we think of that? Whew, I need a, I need a drink. Yeah, I need a drink too. Ah, uh, and I would like to thank anyone who... Oh, Stephen Wilson, thank you for the Canadian Five. This is why you don't drink and stream, kids. Yeah, exactly. Although we should do that sometime. I play PUBG better when I'm a little a little buzzed. <laughs> he doesn't. <laughs> no, I just think I do, right? I just think I do. Exactly. Right? Uh, okay, so I only have one more um, topic to go over today, and it's just it's just a, a voice topic. I don't have any documents or anything. Um. Uh, Brandon, have you been getting any questions from anybody, or or, or what? Or, or are we just should, yeah, should we I have proceed? A few questions. Anything topical on what we've talked about so far, or should I continue to my last story? Yeah, there's a couple about Alex Maurer's case. Let's do it. Go for All it. All right, Chandler asks if somehow the judge accepts Alex late, Alex's late reply, would the case go to court or to trial? I suppose there's still a lot to do before the case goes to court. Um, also, chat, let me know if you can hear Brandon okay. I'm not entirely sure if his volume is, is, is matched with everything else. 
Um, the the question was, uh, will the will the case go to court if the if the pleading is accepted? So let's say that I file stuff because I'm going to be filing stuff shortly, and I file stuff and I say that I'd like this the, the pleading to be struck, and the judge says, you know, those were all good arguments, Mr. French, but um, you know, defendant, you know, it was only one day late, you know, so it, it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Let's just say that that's what the court said. That means that her pleading is now live and I have to respond to it. There are other things I can do. Um, I So I can file a, a motion to dismiss, just like we were just reading about for the last hour. And um, that would be something completely separate from my motion for contempt or, or uh, uh, motion to strike. So that's one possibility. I could also file a, mo a motion for judgment on the pleadings or a motion for summary judgment before the case goes to trial, and that's actually what I expect would happen if we did go to that that hypothetical where her pleading is a valid pleading and the judge wants me to respond to it, then um, we would likely not be going to trial, but rather just to uh, more uh, more back and forth on the on the docket. Maybe one or two meetings in court. Maybe I have to have Alex deposed. You know, questions under oath in front of a court reporter, but not in court. And then I use all of that to make a motion for summary judgment. Uh, I don't know that Alex would know how to respond to a motion for summary judgment, so that would be interesting as well. But um, that would be what we would do. Leon's Cape, thank you very much. Or Leon's Cape, wow. I'm doing so good today. Leon's Cape, thank you very much for the five uh, British pounds. Fantastic, but not delusional. <laughs> I think you were correct. I think it's Leon's Cape. It could be Leon's Cape, but it could also be Leon's Cape, right? Right. Like the cape that Leon wears. Anthony English, thank you for the Australian $5. What is the difference between dismissal and dismissal with prejudice? Oh, yes, thank you. Very good, very good point. Uh, dismissal without prejudice means you have the court's leave or permission to try to file something again. Or even if the case is dismissed, you could go refile the case again. With prejudice means that this court has specifically ordered that this matter is dead, and all you can do is appeal to a higher court. Next question, Brandon. Yes. Um, does getting a default judgment in the Maurer case hurt setting a precedent or uh, a historical case? Uh, this would be still a historical case. This is almost never, in my humble opinion, a precedent-setting case. I don't think the judge will be issuing any new law in this case. Maybe if the case was going towards trial... And it seemed like it was worth it to add other defendants, or excuse me, other plaintiffs. Maybe the judge would recognize the level of abuse or something and, and, and find make a new finding of damages that this level of DMCA abuse constitutes a trebling or tripling of damages. I don't know that it actually sets any useful legal precedent besides being able to refer to this case as a look at what happened here, and if anything ever similar happens, you know, here's how they handled it here. That's about it. I don't, I don't think this is a terribly precedential case. Question. Next question. Question from Morpheus. Uh, will we make a lawful has masses hat to sell? Yes, we are going to be working on merchandising. Um, the Imagos case and my responsibilities to you have been taking up most of my time, and I have been successfully shutting down some of my law practice to make more time for you and all of that's going very very well and and so yes we should have news on all of that very shortly i can't commit to a time um i hate to uh, star citizen it but uh i i i we it will be quality we will just take our time getting there i'm sure i have a question from me on behalf of everybody in the chat because people were asking about this how do you file a case as a John Doe? Oh, oh, this is that's a really good one. I've done this before, um, or at least I've I've defended a case as a John Doe before, or representing a John Doe. So you you file all of your things in the case, pretending that your client's name is John Doe. 
But the judge is, of course, not going to like that, and you're not allowed to do that without permission. So you also have to file something asking for permission. So you basically file your response on time saying, I'm a, you know, John Doe, and then you simultaneously file something that says, I'm asking the judge for permission to be to stay John Doe for the duration of the case. This is usually known as a motion for a protective order. Uh, some people, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't necessarily have to call it that. It, it just helps to, you know, make it sound like it's what you want. You, you want to proceed anonymously through the case. And in order to show that, in order to, in order to get that, you have to show that you're going to suffer an injury that is unrelated to the, to the, in, to the, 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 the natural consequences of the case. In this case, a police officer suing Black Lives Matter would probably gain a probably get a lot of, 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 of internet hate and maybe a lot of in real life hate as well, which may not necessarily have been warranted. It sounds like the police officer was seriously injured. I um, think it hit him in the I think the rock the concrete rock hit him in the head. So this is not a even the court said that they didn't want to minimize the injuries to the police officer and so I think the court allowed the police officer to continue as John Doe because the although the the police officer's filing was misguided trying to hold Black Lives Matter accountable um the injury was not a superfluous or fictitious injury so she wanted him to be able to proceed in court, have his day in court, make his allegations, and not have it further tarnish his reputation um, by putting his name out there. When, for at least the injury part, he had a legitimate dispute. Uh, I understand trying to sue everyone involved, even if the injury was only caused by one person, because that one person may not have money, you might not be able to serve that person, they might not show up to court, and you might not be able to recover damages from them. Whereas if there was an organization like a hospital or a school or a large business that has insurance, you will definitely be able to get money if you win. So that's why you would go after Black Lives Matter, because that collectively that organization sounds at least like it has more money than than any one individual would. I don't recommend you sue loosely organized groups like Black Lives Matter, obviously for all the reasons we just went over, but uh, that's why they let him proceed anonymously. Other questions? Yes, one from Keith. Um, would a perjury case against Alex set up a precedent for someone going overboard on DMCA takedowns? Not a precedent. Uh, there's no precedent that I'm aware of needed in criminal law for this. She has committed some kind of perjury. She has committed, she has violated the criminal law a, a, a bit. Um, it's just a matter of the prosecutor being, mo excuse me, motivated enough to prosecute her. That's it. Midas. We have to convince the prosecutor to prosecute. Apologies. Midas asks, um, so would this last case um, be, apply to the insane clown posse um, being identified as a loosely organized gang? Um, the, the, yeah, I, I don't know that it's worth it to cite this as legal precedent because this is in Louisiana and I think their case was somewhere else. Um, but but yeah, that's I would expect expect them to be making lots of arguments under the First Amendment, freedom of association, and you saw a lot of them in that in that uh, opinion. So yes, maybe not this specific Louisiana opinion, but you certainly citing lots of the cases that this opinion cited. Um, and even I, if I was representing Insane Clown Posse, which I'm not, and probably would not, but if I was, I would probably. Uh, um, read this case at least to get an idea of how the judge went about making her arguments. Next. I have a few questions here that are super long. And so I want to apologize to those people. Um, I have a question from Nathan Talsian. Uh, he said, you mentioned being able to submit information for a judge's consideration, despite said information not being directly admissible as evidence. What, 
Yeah, like a news article or um, a study or something like that. Um, if you if you feel like it's common knowledge enough, and you want to do your research, I don't I don't know the exact uh, standards for judicial notice everywhere or even in my own jurisdiction. But something you would attempt to do basically is file what you need to know, uh, what, what the judge needs to know with the judge. Um, so, for example, you might get a judge that doesn't know what Twitter is. So you might print out a bunch of newspaper articles about Twitter or the Wikipedia article about Twitter, and you might ask the judge to put the judge on judicial notice of what Twitter is. You're not, it's, just, it's, it's not the same thing as submitting evidence supporting your claims. It's not like submitting a Wikipedia article about Twitter is going to make your claims more or less true. It's, it's just that you need the judge to understand something that is commonly understood. Uh, Duct Tape and Dreams gives $3.14. Thanks for the pie. How does the court handle someone named John Doe? Um, they just keep referring to them as John Doe publicly, but the court knows who they are. The court has their name and address and all their contact information and everything behind the scenes. And then things at the end of the case, if so say for example that John Doe lost the case uh, and the court found that there was no longer any injury to John Doe that we're worried about, uh, then they would reveal their name. If the court felt that there would be some other unrelated injury that's not necessary, then the judge would withhold the name. I'll give you an example. I represented some of the first, one of the first defendants in the first Malibu Media copyright trolling case in the country, in Philadelphia here. And all five of our defendants wanted to proceed anonymously as John Doe's. And uh, so we each wrote up our protective orders, and we actually did get permission from the opposing party to proceed anonymously. And so all five defendants proceeded anonymously until the trial, where the four defendants who had settled and ended their case uh, stayed anonymous while the fifth defendant, Brian White, who had uh, more or less revealed his own name, the judge determined that there was no longer any point to keeping his name secret and, and revealed his name. Uh, honestly, it's been so long, I'm not even 100% sure that he even filed a motion for protective order, but but uh, the rest of us did. We, we all wanted our clients to stay uh, uh, to stay anonymous. So the judge just, just keeps track of the clients, usually referring to them, to them by number, John Doe number one, John Doe number two, John Doe number three. And there have been cases with 6,000 John Doe defendants. Some of those were BitTorrent uh, piracy cases. Uh, so, Brandon, I see you saying you're going to mention something. What are you going to mention? He was actually talking about people that are genuinely in real life named John Doe. How would the court handle something like that? Would they have to say oh. um, in one of their responses that this is an actual person and not an anonymous protective order person yeah probably they would probably have to say that this is this is the the protective order against john doe a person residing at yada 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 going going by the actual name or they would add the latin sick sic or something like that to say that this is the real name i i think i think they would have to they would have to add a line in there that says this is this is not a generic reference to a person to a generic to like a an unnamed person or anonymous person this is a real name john smith or john doe or something i think yeah i think you'd have to say that yeah <clears throat> any more questions <coughs> uh not at this time <clears throat> okay the last thing i wanted to talk about was a little bit of uh youtube Add a demonetization. There's been a bunch of videos and a bunch of complaining uh, going around about ads being demonetized or, or, or YouTube videos being demonetized as not suitable for all ads. And you may remember the ad apocalypse back in what was it, March or April? Yeah, I think it was March or April when um, various media organizations tried to claim that YouTube let ads run against uh, terrible videos, and it was almost not true. It was true that you could trick the system into doing that for a short period of time, but it was not true that they were running ads in general on terrorist videos. But either way, we had the ad apocalypse happen, and then a few months later here, some of us are starting to see that some of our videos are getting demonetized under very strange circumstances. 
Me, for example, I had last week's second Alex Maurer stream automatically demonetized before I even filled in the title and description of the stream. Before I started streaming, before I there was nothing. It was there was absolutely nothing there except the placeholder text from the a previous stream. Now, in YouTube's defense, the word abuse was in the text for the, one of the previous streams. But I removed that, yet the stream remained classified as not suitable for all advertisers. So I posted something about this on Twitter. I was a little bit upset. Maybe not upset. Concerned. Concerned would be a good word. And a few people responded by posting some videos that other people had made about their things getting demonetized. And uh, I think I'll, I'll link to one of them in the description here. I forget who the one I watched was. Actually, I do want to find it. Ooh, sorry. Real quick. Uh, I do want to find it real quick here, so I'm going to look through my history. Was it Philip DeFranco or? No. Uh, my history, not my video manager. Thank you very much. Uh, it was Valley News Network. YouTube's inappropriate ad bot is broken. And I'm going to post the link in the chat right here. Oh, why did it? I didn't want it to start at a certain. Oh, it's it's going to start at a certain time. Hang on, that's not the link. <clears throat> there you go. This is the link that starts at the beginning. Thank you. Excuse me. Now I got the hiccups. This will be fun. And I guess I'll post it in the description as well, somewhere wherever that is. And um, the author of this video points out that he has had videos demonetized under very odd circumstances. He's been producing consistent content that hardly ever has uh, any 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 problems and any any controversial anything. He's usually streaming video games. He's usually making creative content with video games. Uh, so he was very concerned and and surprised that his videos were getting demonetized automatically and without any notice or warning or explanation. So he contacted YouTube several times and through several uh, several avenues and they told him that they were you know sorry about it and here's the guidelines and please read the guidelines specifically and be very careful to follow the guidelines but Otherwise, we don't know why your video got demonetized, and that he was really he was really pissed off. It sounded like a cop out, right? I mean, come on, Google, YouTube doesn't want to tell you what you're doing wrong. What the hell, man? I mean, why can't you tell me not to talk about uh, you know Saudi Arabia or not to talk about? Why can't you give me some specific guidelines? And so, I was watching Valley uh, VNN's video, and it hit me. He was talking about how it is an AI, that an AI has been implemented to demonetize things automatically, that the AI is being taught by humans who are being paid a number of dollars an hour to sit at a desk and watch YouTube videos and classify them based on the guidelines. And that this this filtering AI is simply learning from your uh, the things that get demonetized and your appeals of the things that get demonetized. Yes. And the author went on to say that YouTube has said that they not only want you to request manual review of things that get demonetized that you think should should not be demonetized, they need you to uh, refer these things to, to manual review when they get demonetized because the bot doesn't learn any other way. And then it hit me. That was the moment it hit me. I realized exactly what's going on, or at least I think I realized exactly what's going on here. The bot doesn't know because YouTube couldn't teach it, because YouTube and Google's programmers couldn't teach it what it needed to know, because we don't 
No, because there isn't a known body of knowledge in human understanding as to how to identify what is unacceptable for advertising content on YouTube. There isn't one. It doesn't exist. You can't go to the CEO of YouTube or a lowly employee of YouTube and say, should all these videos be demonetized? Should this video be demonetized? Do we talk about LGBT issues with, with ads or without ads? You can't just categorize things like that. It is way more complicated. So I'm guessing that what YouTube had to do was build like a Bayesian AI or something similar where it looks at content, it identifies many different facets of the content, what is said, how it's said, the tone, the volume, the participants, the colors, the scenes, the everything that an AI could possibly identify, dump it all into a database that another AI can then analyze and see, okay, does this, does this seem to fall into a category that would offend our advertisers? And if it does, it flags it. It immediately gets demonetized monetized, excuse me, and then when triggered for manual review, a human, or rather probably a group of humans, not, you know, a loosely affiliated group of humans, like, independently review the video, those reviews and the results of it are probably not just a checkbox, but a bunch of categories and, and other identif identifications and reasonings that then the AI understands, and it then takes into its Bayesian mind and says, okay, I now know why, I, you know, not, not to demonetize that when when I see that those that 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 coincidence of facts that coincidence of 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 elements in an entry, and and YouTube and Google simply can't do this either because they lack the actual ability because there's that much information to be programmed, or literally we just don't as humans really understand the exact nature of what's offensive and what's not, so they're going to let a computer figure it out. And I think that's simultaneously cool and extremely uh, concerning because we're basically turning over this entire experiment that is YouTube to a demonetization bot. I, I really hope you guys know what you're doing, YouTube, because it's, it's going to be an interesting ride from here on out. If I can say and so I wanted to ask you all, starting with Brandon, I guess, what do you think of that? Is that, am I close? Am I, am I right on? What do we think is happening here? You are exactly correct. YouTube, the reason that YouTube can't tell you why your video was demonetized is because they don't freaking know, all right? They have a bot that is doing this, and it reviews all the videos, and it makes a decision, and it's all AI learning. They don't know. They, they can't look. The bot doesn't give them a reason. It just does it. It's a, it's a deep learning neural net, and we just can't, it's not like you can go into a neural net and say, you know, hey, what does this one, what, what does this set of ones and zeros represent? Is this like, yes, we, we demonetize things about, you know, explosions? It, and no, it doesn't work that way. Some people want to see explosions when they're done by a safety professional, you know, in a safe environment, in a controlled situation, etc. They don't want to see explosions where people get dismembered, you know? So the bot has to be able to figure out what about the video was different between those two scenarios and you and um you and marshall is right uh it's not bayesian modeling i'm just using that term to sound smart it's deep learning neural net um bayesian modeling was what we used for spam bots back in the day and i think we were we, we've moved well past that but you get the idea it's a basically a blank bot with some instinct built in and the methods of learning but not necessarily the data for learning and then we're the ones filling in the data and correcting its mistakes and just like a human a you know a human intelligence it is learning uh and making mistakes and correcting itself and learning and correcting itself based on its feedback we only exist because of feed the you know the millions and millions and trillions and trillions of feedback loops in our brains same thing with an ai yeah so the bot doesn't understand the things that it's looking at right you can't go to the bot and say hey, uh, why was this video demonetized? Was it because of the explosions? The bot's like, what are explosions? I just demonetized it because this is similar to other things that have been demon not demonetized, you know? It right. doesn't know what abuse is. It doesn't know what... I'm not going to say anymore because it might get demonetized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, it does know that these are things that have been demonetized in the past by report, and it takes those in and it makes a decision based on that. And that would be why YouTube needs us to 
re have the content reviewed manually. It's because if this is not abuse, the bot needs to know that, and so it, so it can correct it. Uh, Jonathan Loto says YouTube is probably run by bots now. Absolutely. That's probably not far off at all. Absolutely correct. Um, and believe it or not, uh, not uh, sort of non sequitur, segue into some self promotion. I am working on a book slash novel slash story. I don't know what it will be. All about my interpretation of a fictitious future in which we've overused AI and it has figured out as it has become sentient, but it became sentient without us knowing and took over in a very unexpected way. And now we are at its mercy and how we overcome the mercy, you know, the being at the mercy of the AI with like either the second American Civil War or, you know, the second worldwide or the first worldwide revolution against the AI. So um, I, I'm, I'm putting doing some specific legal like uh, construction, so some some legal things in there, too, to try to make it more interesting from our perspective. But uh, I think that would be a very, very, very interesting concept to explore of what happens when we start overusing these AIs and then things, you know, what, what bad things happen naturally and, and, and et cetera. Well, there is the concept that the Matrix already has us, that we are already in a simulation of some kind. And, uh, you know, it's not like we'd ever be able to really know it and understand it, but uh, or that we could simply just be in one of millions of, of simultaneously occurring uh, microverses. It's all very uh, interesting physics. Actually... And theoretical. Actually, the scientists that have theorized that we're already in a simulation have also theorized that it is basically just as likely that we are in a simulation and that the people who are simulating us are also in a simulation and so on and so on that's, yes that's, that's probably more likely than than the than the uh, than one one independent simulation that is being run by one you know separate entity yeah. I would much it's much easier to believe that the that the the, the, the universe is is multiple feedback loops Um what I, what still blows my mind is that the like like the, the the heat death of the universe like really like this this whatever simulation would be would have an end like it's it's not so I mean it really could be like like what's Rick and Morty with uh what game was that they were playing um Earl or whatever where you get to you could play the guy's life and then like Morty was Morty like lived his entire life and made a family and everything and then got yanked back into Rick's reality. Yeah. Could you imagine if that's what happens when you die? Like, you know, goodbye, my family. It's been such a wonderful life. Finally, my pain and suffering will end. And then you're like, whoop. Oh, shit. I'm back in the white room with these people I hate. Can you imagine? <laughs> you know? All right. I want you to, to imagine a, a scenario, okay? <laughs> like, I was trying to escape from this reality. So. Yeah, go ahead. So. Tying my shoe. You have basically unlimited computer capacity available to you and you're in like the year 2400 or something okay and you want to advance technology but you don't want to to wait for that technology to advance right what do you do okay you make simulations that simulate us and you let it run at like you know a million times speed and you let them develop technology do you see sure and then you yeah i get that, that except we don't currently have an understanding of how we could do all of that processing in parallel. Um, currently, in order to simulate even a small part of our world would take more computing power than exists in the known universe. Like, not just on Earth, but I mean, like, could be created by the known universe. And calculating every single one of these frames, for example, would, 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 you know, would be impossible in real time. Um, and we're not just saying that because, like, we don't have the technology, but rather it's, like, sort of not within the physics of the universe to be able to calculate all those things, at least not within our universe. So there would have to be, like, a larger or faster running universe that we're not aware of. Like, so if we're running on a simulation, it would have to be running on a different computer than the one that we're, like, simulating. So... It's it's a hard concept that this would be a sentient simulation by someone, because 
they would have to have more computing power than like like on the order of magnitude of like trillions of times our com- of like the computing power that we think the known universe would be capable of. But here's is, is what I'm talking. Here's about. a suggestion: What if the known universe is just the constraints that they've put on the simulation so that it doesn't use too much power? Oh, that's that's yes, possible. <laughs> If we like, and that's probably the most likely scenario is that we're is that you're like individually in a simulation that only your senses are being simulated. Yeah. Like a basically a matrix, rather than a, uh, rather than everything is being simulated, including your consciousness. We got a little bit derailed here, though. <laughs> a Dyson sphere of a computer, yeah. So any questions, any comments about the Alex Maurer or the Supreme Court complaint or the Black Lives Matter thing? I have one question from Yarbar. It's a cool name. Um, he says, in, is an interview between a person and a reporter classed as a private conversation as opposed to a public speech or statement made to a group of reporters? And no, generally speaking, when you're speaking to a reporter, you should be very careful because they're going to go and report on what you told them, especially if you know that they're a reporter. Maybe if you have a private conversation with someone and you don't realize that they're reporting on it, uh, you, you, you could... Uh, but they're reporting facts. They're not reporting your likeness. They're not like saying, like, these are words that we're going to use to sponsor the latest Starbucks uh, uh, iced coffee or whatever. They're saying, these are the words that Leonard French said in response to our question about an issue. That's news reporting. I don't think you really have a a privacy issue there. Although I, I, maybe somebody could find a law or something. I am not as well versed in free speech as, as I'd like to be. Um... So I would just when you, if you've talked to it's basically if you talk to anybody about a controversial thing, I would begin by figuring out who they are and making sure that they're not going to use the information against you, because there is nothing that prevents people from telling others what you said. No, I don't think there's any law against me from having a conversation with Brandon and then going and saying, "Hey, Brandon told me this." That's like that's like gossip 101, right? Yeah. All right, we have a question. It's only if I say untrue things. Man, I'm really bad at reading pauses <laughs> as breaks. Um, we have a question from Tao, um, which is in regards to, I believe, the Alex Maurer case and also the Black Lives Matter case kind of together. Okay. Um, what kind of responsibility does the judge have in doing their own research into a case or the circumstances surrounding a case? A judge has a some kind of duty for of of diligence. Um, I'm not exactly sure that the judge has any duty to discover facts or. Well, let's let's start with this. I'm I don't think a judge has any duty to discover facts that are not brought to them by the parties. But a judge does have the discretion to search out facts that are not brought to them by the parties. I'm not sure how much of a duty the judge has to discover law that was not brought to them by the parties. There are some laws that the judge does have to enforce, even if the parties don't. Um, But for the most part, the judge doesn't have to help the parties figure out what law they should be citing or what reasoning they should be using. And so you can't just put something on the record that says, my friend owed me money, he didn't pay me the money, uh, here's the contract that says he owes me money. You actually have to say the words, "I want to be paid this money," and I, th- and you know, and and show the reason why. In that case, you showed a contract. That's that's pretty good. So would a could a could a court say, "Well, you submitted a contract and you submitted a claim, but you didn't say that the law supported you"? No, the judge can't do that. But the judge. Uh, could say, you know, oh, I looked up your contract because it was in this news article and they they had the actual, you know, contract and it's different than the one that you submitted. So I'm going to hold a hearing on whether you submitted a fraudulent contract. Those sorts of things the judge can decide. But they have to explain them and they're all context sensitive. It's not like things automatically happen one way or the other. Um... Matthias Larson asks a really good question. The term off the record, is it worth anything or is it just in the movies? Uh, It is worth something, but it is only worth something in certain circumstances. Literally, when you're in a deposition 
or in front of the judge when the record is being recorded by the court reporter, the stenographer, on that funky little typewriter thing that they have there. Um, and you want to talk about something without it being on the record, you ask the judge or the opposing party and the stenographer for permission to go off the record. Then the stenographer will, you know, say, okay, and stop typing and stop their recorder. You'll have the conversation, which will not be recorded. There will be no tra transcript of it. And then you'll say at some point, okay, let's go back on the record. And then the next thing will be back on the record. And the, the, the court reporter will put in there, went off the record at such and such a time, back on the record at such and such a time but she will she or she will not put what was said and this is a good thing and a bad thing because sometimes those things that were said off the record can make people think that things are happening and then you go back on the record and then the, when those things aren't said if you didn't catch it you may have just gotten trolled or conned so uh other questions yeah we have one more question um, it's from Keith, and I need to give a little backstory to this. So, a few weeks ago on one of the Sunday services, you removed an ad from a page um, using Firefox's developer console, um, yeah. which could or might technically be a breach of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Or the terms of service of the site that I visited, sure. Yes, yes. Um, and so Keith asks... Uh, do you think that there will ever be restrictions on the use of the CFAA in situations like this, where, like, you're using, you're making a video and you don't want that advertisement in your video because you aren't being sponsored by that, right? And so I, yeah, I actually do have the ability to set stuff like that to, to, to deny certain kinds of ads to run on my videos. Right. And so do you think that they will put restrictions on the CFAA because it's kind of out of date at this point? Well, yes and no. Uh, the CFAA, the way laws get written, politicians, legislators can write laws pretty much any way they want, and it's up to the judiciary and th usually with, with a plaintiff to fight it. So we would need someone to use the CFAA in that way in order to then, and then have that person challenge it in order to have it reformed or rewritten. And it would be then rewritten only by judicially created law. The other way that it could be modified is if the legislature or politicians go back in and, and rewrite it themselves. And that would take some kind of lobbying or, or some kind of effort because politicians these days do not go out on their own and look for issues to fix. They usually uh, are approached by people who are being paid to approach them to tell them about issues of a special interest. That's not necessarily the good or bad thing. You could It's open to interpretation of whether it's a good or bad thing. Lots of opinions there. But what I'm saying is that that's how it currently works. And so if you want that to be the solution, you should form a lobbying group and go talk to your politicians around the country and try to get enough votes and support. You probably hire your lobbying firm or lawyer to create a sample or proposed law and then you give that to your politicians and ask them to float it on the committee and then from the committee to, you know, get it in on the floor to, for votes on the House and the, and the Senate and then for presentment to the president for signing. If you were able to do all of that, then yes. Otherwise, if you think there's something wrong with the CFAA because it overreaches or it's unconstitutional in some way, then you have to make those arguments in court. And only when you are the person charged or when you are a person who is likely to be charged, you have to be able to show a concrete injury or uh, an, an, an uh, unavoidable, irreparable injury uh, in order to have standing to sue like that. Um, I have one that I'm going to ask here. Databang asks why a stenographer, why you would use a stenographer when you can just record the audio. Well, the audio is not uh, a transcript. The audio is not the text. And although we're getting better with recording audio and having a computer convert it to text, uh, court reporters are still expected to do this by hand and they're still expected to be certified to do it correctly. And so... We use a stenographer, and the stenographer records the audio, and the audio gets gets encoded with the text alongside the audio that is being spoken. And then all of that is available for purchase. You may start to understand why we haven't moved on yet. For purchase from the transcriptionist or the transcriptionist's boss or service. 
usually for a few dollars per page or a few hundred dollars minimum per transcript. So th that's the reason why we don't what we haven't gotten rid of stenographers is one, it's a job, and there's lots of people who do this job, so you can't just eliminate an entire industry you know, overnight, can you? Um, and two, we do need a person to certify that the transcript matches the recording. And so that person is the certified transcriptionist. And so that's why. Okay, any other questions? Anybody want to discuss anything else while we're live on stream? Otherwise, it has been a great two hours, and, uh, and I will bid you adieu. We do have that one case that was brought up earlier. Uh, I have the research here, but obviously that yeah. would be going into a whole new case. Yeah, why don't we um, save that one for next week? It is a Second Amendment case, I heard. And uh, that sounds like a really good, a really good uh, opportunity to do some other Second Amendment stuff, too, at the same time. Kate Floss wants a flea update. Uh, I have not found any more fleas. So I have no idea where he's getting them from. He, he, I gave him his other flea treatment. I really have no idea why, why uh, occasionally a flea jumps off of him. I have not found any on me. I have not found any flea bites. I have not found any uh, anything. And look at this. And look at this. He comes over here. He comes over here right now when he hears me talking about him. He comes over here to say hi. Hello, puppy. Hello, puppy. How are you? He comes over here to say hi to all of you. Aw. What a good boy. What a good boy. Yeah, it looks like the flea must have bit him right here on his, on his head because he's got a little scab. But it looks like the flea didn't get very far because he is treated for flea stuff. And uh, the flea was not in good shape when I found it. It was not jumping. It was just kind of crawling around. So I think that's what happens. <laughs> Ain't no bugs on me. <laughs> Got no bugs on me, my friends. Got no bugs on me. There might be bugs on you other mugs, but there ain't no bugs on me. <laughs> so. so any other questions or else I'll restart the music and we'll take it out. Daniel asks, what is the velocity of an unladen swallow? Uh, European or African swallow? <laughs> Jinzo asks for an H3H3 H3 update. <laughs> I, I like their new studio. It's really, it's really pretty. Oh, the podcast studio? Very, very professional and high quality. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Doggy. <laughs> Dog nose. <laughs> Actually, there's a question in the lobby of the Discord that wasn't directly asked to you, but I actually would like to mention it. Go for it. Um, so Babular says, so he's being a devil's advocate against the YouTube neural network. He says, so what if there's something that you find offensive or that... Um, that, that other people don't. And Dark Babylon answered, you either send a manual review in or you consider cultural differences. And I just wanted to say that I think that they actually have different neural nets for different cultures. It's like oh, different wow. areas. Because like, for example, like something in like India might be offensive in America and it wouldn't be offensive in India, you know? Um, like they, there's a lot of different culture. What do you think about that? Leonard? That's interesting. I, I certainly could see them using different neural, neural networks for different cultures, and definitely because different things are offensive to different people. Um, or that this might be a feature that's built into the existing neural net, that they that they, that it, it accounts for, you know, who was the viewer and where what what is what is what do we know about their culture? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that dog, that dog is, is so is... close to the camera. <laughs> oh, stretch. Oh, you can see his little teeth. Well, big Dog teeth. Dog stretch. Yeah, we can try to move the camera a little bit. Uh, there's a question from someone saying, is there any chance we could do a Q&A stream where we use some of the previous questions and try to answer them? Since I have, obviously don't go through all the questions and put them on the stream. Oh, don't walk away. Come here. Come here. I was getting the camera so that we could see you. Sorry for the... Here we go. 
A. Yeah, I should have turned that off before doing that. Hey, puppy. There you go. There you go. There's my puppy boy. There's my puppy boy. <laughs> Sorry, Kate. <laughs> this dog is so happy. He is the world's happiest dog. Um, anyway, yeah, so Q&A stream, what do you think? Yeah, Q&A stream sounds good. Because we have a lot. <laughs> oh, honey, I love you too. Why is Arizona not on daylight savings time? Because Arizona just wants to be different. Yeah, I think so. So yeah, for half the year, the... he's looking at him. He's alternating looking at the camera and looking at himself. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, this is Nico. Ilsa is elsewhere. I don't know. She's hiding someplace. She said her name, so she might show up. Ilsa. <laughs> Elsa girl. She's still sore. Oh, here we go. Daylight savings is still relevant, anything goes. Oh. <laughs> uh. Oh, hey, look, it's Elsa. Mm hmm. Oh, she's gonna go back to her crate. Good girl. Aww. You can come here. You can come here. Oh, they were exchanging licks. That was so cute. You can come here. You wanna lay down? Oh, she's gonna go lay down the other direction. Okay. All right. <laughs> Nico, your breath is horrible. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, here we are. Yeah. You can you can see the camera moving with his heavy breathing because he's going. Ah, 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 ah. <laughs> I love you too, boy. I'm gonna put this down here. There we go. Ah, don't move. Uh, Yoix asks if it's Nico with a K or a C. It's Nico with a K, like Nikola Tesla. This is my good boy. All right, everybody. Let's take it out. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I want to thank all of my wonderful Patreon supporters for supporting me. I have several supporters who are supporting at the $50 a month level. Joshua Meinsiger, John Steele, John Cripps, Nate Beck, Lydia Collinson, and Weston Loney. There are also 162 of you supporting at the $5 level. You are scrolling on that LED panel behind me, and I'll put your names in the description below. Um, there are also 300 of you, three, what would I say it was? 378 of you supporting at the $1 plus level with no requested reward, and you are all absolutely amazing. I love each and every one of you, and this wouldn't necessarily be this possible without your support. You, your, your monthly contribution helps me remain financially stable so that I can create more of these videos and commit to more live streams and more, more shows and buy more equipment to, to have more access to things. Most recently, I spent your money on a uh, upgraded subscription to a news service that lets me find things like that CFAA complaint and that uh, Louisiana um, 
uh, opinion um, much more easily than having to search and scour the internet for stories. So uh, I think we're going to be able to bring you many, many, many more news stories as well. Uh, basically about as fast as I could possibly produce them quality, I can put them out. Uh, I don't expect that I'll be putting out, you know, hundreds of videos a day, but um, uh, the goal that I'm, at, I'm getting to right now is at least three videos a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, plus the live streams on Sunday, and then plus any other uh, streaming that I feel like doing for, for game, video games and stuff like that. So that's my goal, and I'm going to try to keep myself to this for the month of October uh, to commit to three uh, edited videos, a, three well, edited or, or live streams, so we'll see about that. So, thank you all so very much for joining me. You are all wonderful people. It's amazing that there's so much interest in the law, and that you guys uh, have so many amazing, so so many things to say. So many insightful and uh, educated and uh, uh, useful things to say. Get questions that are really on. Uh, uh, relevant topics and and help people learn and this is just one of the best communities that that I have that I've ever seen on YouTube on the internet I'm really impressed with you guys so thank you all so very much I am Leonard French your favorite copyright attorney I will let the current song finish as it's one of my favorites and then I'll I'll end the stream if anybody has anything to ask you have approximately 1 minute and 30 seconds Nico is a weapon of mass distraction <laughs> oh yes don't forget let's not let's let's pimp our discord channel we have a discord uh our discord server and there are many uh things we can do on there we can talk about topics of law we can talk about things that are not topics of law there are voice chat channels and we have video game channels uh you can meet up with people to play video games p people who are on who have a similar uh you know type of train of thought as we are here. Um, I do moderate the Discord. It, people are removed when they get uh, unruly, so please let me know if there's any troubles, uh, and please yourself, you know, be a, a nice uh, person, and you'll be fine. So, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and this is Brandon, who has been with me. Cap Brandon, Captain Yosho, please say hi. hi. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Love you all. I will see you in my next video. Let's, uh, I guess, put my regular camera on for the out here. <clears throat> now that's not good enough. We want the uh, we want the dog cam. We'll do the dog cam for the out, and I'll do the out this way. <laughs> How about that? Oh nope, we're gonna lose the dog now. <laughs> all right, guys. I love you all. Have a good week. I'll see you in my next video. Bye. Any second now, I swear.